Hello, Lorenzo here. Episode 5, Galileo Contracting. It has been a while, but here we are with the next video. The mission today is simple. Let's have a look at the tracking station. We will rescue the two occupants of the Tri-Capsule Mark 1. That went on a mission to IOTA last time, but sadly ran out of fuel. Its trajectory will intercept IOTA, and then loop back to Gale, where it has a low pass. So what we're going to try is to launch a ship, intercept this capsule at that low pass and then do a mission to IOTA or uh, to IOTA or to possibly to CTI. We will try and determine that based on the delta V of the ship um, and not run out of fuel again hopefully. Now as to the ships that we have available for this, two ships have been submitted. Let's have a look. That is the Griswold Lupulus Hyperbolus that offers us a strapping 8.6 kilometers per, per second of delta V and it looks juicy with lots of red lights and um, well explody goodness controlled explosions of course and then we have the barrel of boom which is cheaper quite a lot cheaper actually um, and promises more explosions by the name let's have a look at this this will give us 8.2 kilometers per second of delta V which by the numbers is less but then again, it is also uh, more cheap. And the capabilities look otherwise fairly the same, except that the second to last stage has a pretty low thrust to weight and a burn duration of 7 minutes. Now, I think I'm going to go for the Hyperbolus first, uh, because the thrust to weights are a little bit higher and the overall capability is just slightly higher. Uh, that said, of course, if this one were to crash and burn, we will, of course, look at the Barrel of Boom as a good second alternative. Um, without further ado, then, let's go to the launch pad. This is a rescue mission, so we are... Actually, we have two passengers here. Can they also re-enter safely? That's the question. That is a good question. They will all, all burn. Um, yeah, they're going to have uh, they're gonna have three guys on that ship. We're going to go all in with our astronauts here. Let's uh, launch that. Oh wait, unavailable experimental parts. Oh my god, um, that's a problem. Let's go to the R and D building and then um, oh, uh, we didn't save. We didn't save anything. Uh, let's go to the R and D building and see what's up with that. Oh shit, it's these nodes that require uh, part purchasing. Oh, why did I enable that? That's so annoying. All right, we have. Oh god, I probably don't have enough money to get them all do I fifth maybe I do no I'm gonna have to cherry pick oh god that is annoying can I maybe get like a contract so I have enough money to get them all mission control explore Gale no that's not a lot of money this is horrible I don't want to do that oh this is a 60k advance to do some observational surveys of IOTA. IOTA has very low gravity, we should be able to do this, but it's so bothersome. Build a new orbital station around IOTA? No, oh, that's not gonna happen. Temperature surveys? We can do this fairly easily, I think. Measure the temperature in space flight above 54, it's, it's above, 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 below. Area GG18Q. Deadline is year 9. We get an 80k advance now. We don't even have to do the mission right away. I think this is what we're going to have to do. We have to like temperature survey IOTA. I will get a lot of money for it. Well, let's, let's do that. So the mission is now to rescue these guys and put temperature surveys around IOTA. And for that we're going to purchase some rocket parts. I don't think we need this. these ones. We definitely need these ones. We also definitely need these. I'm not sure about these. Let's get the reaction wheel anyway. That's, that's, that's a nice one. Miniaturization. I don't think we have used any of these. Electrics. Ah, they're only 11k. Let's get them. Alright, I think this should allow us to launch the ship as we want it to. Yeah, there we go. All parts are allowed. That is great. And here we are. Let's see, what do we need to do? We need to get into a 
orbit with, yeah, just just a normal equatorial orbit so that we can rendezvous with the tri capsule. And then afterwards, we will figure out when and how to rendezvous. All right, stages look good. Let's do a countdown. Three, two, one. Countdown, go. Whoa, that's loud. It's rocketing off the pad, as it is a rocket, as it should. That's looking great. Let's try a little bit of pitch over. The solid fuel will last for a while longer. We have Jebediah at the helm, so we can use some something resembling SAS performance. We have commit. Does this thing even have a temperature sensor, by the way? I hope it does, because we have sort of committed to taking temperature surveys. Uh, we will figure that out once we're in space. I noticed the barrel of boom had temperature sensor, so if if this one doesn't, that was in retrospect an, an accident to take to take this one. Oh well, space programs aren't made in one day, and we have eight years to do this contract, so maybe we just keep the money. Whoa, there we go, boosters exploding, everything is looking nicely on that front. But 11 kilometers should be fairly easy from now on, I think everything is going predictably well. We have fuel piping into the center core from the outside boosters, they will shortly be ditched. And then it's pretty straightforward, we have a similar setup, three boosters and uh, I presume fuel piping into the center one except smaller ones for, for in-space operations. There we go. Outer boosters falling down in that red light. Where are these red lights? I'm not seeing them. Anyway, they are um, granting an air of magnificence to this launch. We're 35 kilometers now. Atmosphere should be getting appropriately thin so that we may pitch over even more. This thing has quite a bit of burn time remaining because this is the, the skipper engine. It's quite efficient. It's got 320 seconds of specific impulse. And, well, two fuel tanks feeding into that. So, our thrust to weight isn't currently all that, but as we get rid of some of that fuel, it should improve markedly. We're at 55 kilometers. The boundary of atmosphere on this planet is still at 70, so we're almost in space. That is a joy of these smaller planets. Let's have a look. Uh, I wanted to make a video so bad. It was just a problem that the thing that happened was in a dream. I just woke up this morning, I was like, oh my god, unfortunately that didn't happen. I dreamt I was like a spaceship, yeah, I was a spaceship, which was re-entering a planet like Iota with a very thin atmosphere, I know it doesn't have one, but it had a thin atmosphere and it was very high re-entry velocity and I was dodging buildings and canyons, I was like, oh my god, the viewers are going to love this, but unfortunately it wasn't real. Um, returning to reality, as much as this can be called reality, we are currently in space. And our orbit is shaping up nicely. I'm actually going to do the KSP thing and shut down the engine and coast until apoapsis, which is currently at 120 kilometers, and then nicely circularize. This red light here is, by the way, uh, very reminiscent of the overheat indicator. I hope it's not actually the overheat indicator. Um, there we go. 120 kilometers lighting the engine and circularizing that orbit should be no big thing to ask there we go almost there and then we're actually I think we're gonna switch to the tri capsule and just advance time until it's uh, a little bit closer so we have a 100 something by 100 something orbit that's a great starting point and let's switch to the tri capsule <clears throat> this has nothing right it has oh it has a little bit of mono no it has enough mono propellant to like for its um, for its crew all right we shall warp to Wait, is there no mention of this other ship? Go on. Where is where is where are the other guys? Did I lose them somehow? That wouldn't be good. Anyway, these guys are now at IOTA where they will <coughs> <clears throat> ah, sorry for my decrepit health. 
can we do like a crew report or something? Get some science? No, we already been here. Been there, done that. Time warp to sphere of influence change. So we go back to Oh, there it is. The Grisewolf 4. The loopless hyperbolus. So far it is doing exactly what it should. And if it manages to rendezvous, which will be pretty tough, because this one of course will be going pretty fast, and that one is only going at low gale orbit speeds. But still, if it manages to rendezvous, it hopefully should have enough fuel to at least re-enter. And if not, um, let's see. Let's get a little bit... Oh, whoops! Shit, I uh, time warp too far. Fortunately, we can just, without any penalty there, life support is not a thing. We can just try this again. Another time around the rosy. Everybody likes being in zero G, right? That's 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 a no-brainer. Should I use a maneuver node this time? Let's see. Time to periapsis is about ten minutes. So yeah, that's probably already a little bit too late. Let's uh, switch to the loop list four now and see what we can do. Here we are in the night, but we are going to um, let's see. Well, let's see. This thing is going to come at us. I'm not even sure I can still make it. We are going down towards periapsis here, so I am going to. It may be that we have to like wait for another another pass. I want to make a maneuver note, but I don't seem to be able to do so. Is that something we aren't allowed to do yet? I thought we did have maneuver nodes. Let's exit the map view. Oh well, no maneuver nodes apparently. That makes rendezvousing a little bit more difficult. Can we not unlock and purchase them? Let's have a look at the space center. And if it was already available, maybe this switch will un unbug them and uh, enable them for our pleasure. Um, upgrade. Oh shit, this is an expensive one, we can't afford that. Mission control. Flight planning available, yeah, this should do it. Oh, we don't have enough money for it, it's like we need 60 more credits, oh my god. Uh, can we Can we accept another contract? No, we already have. Oh shit, then we, the, the plant the flag on IOTA is the one to get money. Oh snap. That's... Uh, ah, that hurts. Alright, no... No flight planning. That makes this mission uh, quite a bit more difficult in... Um, in how to rendezvous with this um, this guy. We're going to we're going to expend a lot more Delta V that way. Um, Alright, let's try and do it manually. We will have to uh, expand our periapsis to match this one here first although that's not even close the angle there is a a 10 degree offset in angle so let's try and fix that one too do we ooh we don't have any any high grade rcs or anything let's turn on the engine a little bit then to help us turn What's this doing to the angle? Is it increasing or decreasing? It's increasing, so we need to go to the other side. And yes, I know changing um, changing angles this close to the planet is very inefficient, but I'm banking on the fact that this thing has uh, a lot of delta V still, and the mission has been um, changed because of this manual because of this manual. Um, num, 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 manual rendezvousing, it's much more difficult to actually do the mission, so I decided not to care so much about efficiency, alright. Here we go, we will now time warp a little bit further to this point. I'm still in orbit, right? Yes, I am still in orbit. We will point it prograde. I'm just slowly burning the engine to give give like the ship a little bit of rotation because there's no RCS on it. I've asked Jebediah to to do prograde, so I'm not just gonna punch it. And there we go. Oh, we do get these intersect markers. That is interesting. So now I'm going to time warp to this like likely intercept point, 
and then I'm going to slightly elongate our orbit so that hopefully we will intersect at um, we will meet here and then I can just put the pedal to the metal and, and make a rendezvous happen so this is, as long as we get close to one another I should be able to do it like the Kerbal way and um, just point the ship in the direction of the other ship and ignite the engines until until we're rocketing past and then brake and then do the same thing in reverse and then repeat like three or four times and that will then be a rendezvous all right we are pretty much prograde again I'm not sure if this is actually working now it seems everything is like becoming more horrible all right this has um, removed that uh, has emptied the fuel of that stage so we go on to the next stage and actually you know let's let's give it another go we might actually end up um, doing a whole circuit a lot like at almost at the same speed as the other one which is fine because even though that will make the rendezvous take like way longer than it could have because we could have caught it on this pass it will make the final rendezvous much much easier because the relative speeds will be a lot slower so um, I don't think the moon is going to uh, interfere with our attempts this time it's not there yet so we have we, we, we have the luxury of doing it this way so that's exactly what I'm gonna do I'm going to let's see burn and I reckon because this thing is like pretty close we need to be a little bit slower than this one actually so that our orbit will actually end up being longer slightly higher than this one here so there is a lot of rocket burning that is going to uh, happen here these are also yeah they're also piping their fuel into the center column I wonder is there any fuel in here I mean we've got these cutesy landing legs But why? Because there is no propulsion. Oh, there may be for landing back on the planet. Um, anyway, the flag planting on IOTA is going to be a little bit difficult with this because we can't land the whole thing. Oh shit! I overburned like really hard. Oh snap. Um, Alright, that's gonna be a breaking burn then. Oh, that was stupid. Loopless, hyperbolous for sure. This is uh, a hyperbolic orbit. Whoops. All right, let's uh, decelerate. I thought this was going to take like a 10-minute burn. That's the, um, the real solar system influence there. It's like where a lunar insertion will take like a long time. And I can also throttle the engine so I can do this slowly. So here we go. What's this doing to my rendezvous? Is the rendezvous not um, the rendezvous calculator isn't handling this brilliantly? Brilliantly, is it? It's um, not giving me the the, um, the rendezvous time. All right, but I can see like we this this is six minutes from here. This is how far is it to here? That'll be like ten minutes. So it needs to be like ten minutes longer. It needs to be like my apoapsis. Time to apoapsis needs to be like five minutes longer than this one. So it needs to be four days, three hours, and fifty minutes. Oh, that's really precise. Let's let's try and get that. Three hours and fifty minutes. Fifty-three minutes. Alright, let's see what that does for us. This is the slowest rendezvous in the history of spaceflight. This will happen in nine days and then it will be here. I need to be slightly slower still, so maybe I can still do that. If I go prograde and be make myself just a little bit slower. Yeah, here we go. This is going to do it. Hi, yeah, this is uh, Lorenzo from the future. Apparently, for some reason, my sound recording cut out right at this point. So, 
me, future me, is going to take over the narration here. Um, what the hell were we doing? We were doing a rendezvous with the tri-capsule. Oh yeah, by doing really small burns. And here I just overburned. I was like hitting uh, shift for one keystroke and then immediately hit X because we don't have RCS and try to get this um, rendezvous to occur as close as it can. So now we're turning around the capsule, which fortunately is possible thanks to the SAS on board and the relative light weight of the capsule. And there we go. Now we have an intercept of about 25 kilometers. Time warping all the way there. Fortunately, the moon is not here to interfere with these trajectories. That would complicate things for sure. And I don't know why the warp is letting up here. Probably because there was an old warp to apoapsis, or maybe that's just the one I pressed. I don't remember. Anyway, there's nothing left to do rather than, uh, well, continue down. And with the benefit of hindsight, I know when the interesting bits are coming up, so I can talk about other things a little bit. I remember about, what was it, four years now that KSP first came out? And I was going to play it, and I was like, whoa, this rocketry simulator, it's so amazing. I learned a lot about uh, spaceflight concepts and things. And the funny thing is, a lot seems to be crude nowadays, after what SpaceX has been doing with landing the, the first stage. I think I want to like somehow recognize this in the game. It feels wasteful to throw away the first stage always, but then again, that's how it's been done, and, and I, I don't see a gameplay aspect to, to, to not doing it that way, because yeah, sure, you can pilot the booster back, but that's not fun. But anyway, you know, time progresses, things advance, and hopefully always in a nice, positive, and upwards direction. Uh, here, back to the game, we're doing some science, getting those points in for more and further um, node unlocks. Now it's starting to become time to actually do the rendezvous, which should be fairly straightforward. You know, just you know, where where the orbits are not hugely different, the the delta v difference or the the v difference, the speed difference, isn't gonna be tremendous. Uh, so I'm not expecting any problems, and I know what's gonna happen. You don't. Am I saying I'm not expecting any problems because there's a huge surprise coming up, like some weird asteroid just whacking everything or an unforeseen collision? I know you don't. Anyway, going on with the rendezvous, um, switching it to target mode, just under 100 meters per second of uh, relative speed, aiming at relative retrograde. That means um, opposite to the vector of the relative speed uh, so we'll call that relative retrograde a little bit catchier name and we're gonna do this uh, this rendezvous Kerbal style just pointing it in this direction zeroing out the velocity completely and then pointing straight at the target and then burning uh, an, an, an amount of delta V that seems appropriate we have the advantage that we're currently at about 700 kilometers of altitude and heading away from the planet so regular difficulties of uh, curving trajectories and straight lines not matching that well, that not matching that so well, don't apply as much as they would. Of course, our trajectory is still a curve, but it's a um, long, elongated spaghetti-like curve rather than a tight hula hoop curve. If that made sense to you, congratulations! You're officially a rocket scientist, and you could build one. Here we go burning towards the tri-capsule. I'm gonna apply about 100 meters per second, I think. Let us let me stare at the screen. Yeah, 113 meters per second. Whoa, isn't my memory great? Um, that should give us an intercept time of about 250 seconds, given by the distance of 25 kilometers. We will time warp through that, if I recall correctly, and then break. And we'll see if my story about the curvatures not mattering that much will hold up. Uh, because if we were to do this around Earth or even Kerbin, um, it wouldn't work. We'd miss it probably by half or more. And as we were pointing like straight at the target, it is going past, but it's going past at like a kilometer distance. So yeah, trajectories are curved, straight lines still don't work, but they almost work. So as I said, we're doing it the Kerbal way, we're zeroing out our velocity again. And this time we're less than a kilometer away, so we're just gonna burn at it and, you know, get real close. Now, a thing that's been happening the past month is a dragon docking with the International Space Station. In fact, it has just undocked, unburst, I should say, today and has crashed, uh, has landed 
has has returned, has splashed down back at Earth. Um, I'm saying this because I want to draw a parallel between this approach and that approach. This one we're gonna do at about what I'm putting. Let's see. Here we go. It's 30 meters per second or 23, something like that. 20 to 30 meters per second. That's almost highway speed. And the actual approaches to the ISS, they're more like on the order of centimeters per second, at least for the last approaches. But then again, you know, they're working with a once in a multi decade, multinational, multi billion dollar operation with lives at stake, and we're just playing a video game. So you can see the difference. Oh, wow. I almost verbatim repeated that little bit from uh, past me. I remembered it. But you wouldn't have known if I hadn't said that. Oh my god, time travel is so weird. Anyway, here we are. We're at a slightly closer distance again. I think 100 to 200 kilometers. Can't make out the screen in my recording software, but it's alright. We'll approach a little bit more and then slow down again. Hopefully we will not crash into the other ship. Oh, there's been so much foreshadowing now. It's going to be an anti-climax if we don't crash into that ship, isn't it? All right, we're turning around. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Are we going to burn it with our exhaust? Oh, no. Yeah, we're going to just stop right on time. Because our professionals are space monkeys. Um, I mean to say our space monkeys are professionals. They may be green, but they know how to do a rendezvous. There we go. Now, to the transfer, we have two blokes here. Actually, no, we've got a bloke and a gal in the tri capsule. They're gonna EVA on over to our rescue ship whilst chilling out in the 1300 kilometer altitude regions. That number doesn't matter, but I thought to read it out to you anyway. We discover at this point that the passenger capsule doesn't have a door. And if we slam the window to get in, we have to keep on our suit, which isn't comfortable. So rather than doing that, we'll ask our pilot, which is Jebediah, to leave the pilot's seat and scoot on over to the capsule. And here you can tell I'm from the future because we're just going to do that now. And I was talking about it before it happened. Classic giveaway of time travel. So here we have, I think it's Bob who can now safely ingress through the hatch of the primary command module, which he is going to do just splendidly. That leaves us with Valentina in the tri capsule. Actually, I didn't notice, but the red light is being brought from the rescue ship. It's that close. That's a really neat rendezvous. It's, it's bathing the tri capsule in, uh, in red light. Thanks for that, Grisewolf Industries, for uh, adding a little bit of showmanship to our launches. All right, we have to do the same trick again. Bob is joining Jebediah in the passenger compartment. And Valentina, being a one-star pilot, is perfectly suited to take the helm in the command pod. We have heard some faint grumbling from Jebediah in the back, but, you know, he's had his go. Valentina has been in space the longest. She's going to pilot us home. And this is where she learns a little bit of Jebediah's crazy antics. Because as we let look at the telemetry, we're slowly drifting closer to the, closer to the tri-capsule module. We're also carrying three engines. They produce hot rocket exhaust. I think this is a perfect setup for an impromptu experiment, don't you agree? The target has been lit up by some red illumination. And we're going to drift ever so slightly closer before engaging our triple barbecue oven. We'll see what happens soon. Closing the hatch for a possible explosive backlash. Ready. Aim. Wait a little longer. Could get slightly closer. We don't have RCS, so we can't maneuver like right up to it. But we can wait. Inertia is putting us closer. We can use the handy retrograde marker to do it. Let's try this again. Three, two, one. Start getting ready. Aim. Target illumination on. You may fire when ready. She's almost ready. There we go. It didn't burn, it didn't explode, but it did tumble the hell away. Isn't that magnificent? Yeah, we didn't accomplish anything with that, but we, we blasted a ship with rocket exhaust. Isn't that cool? 
I thought that was pretty cool anyway. So now comes the monument monumental question of what the hell are we going to do? We have a rocket ship now full with three astronauts and a, well, two relatively close, here's an accidental time warp, by the way, um, two relatively close destinations in the form of IOTA and CETI, um, both of which we could visit. We have contracts to put a flag on IOTA and to take temperature scans of specific areas of IOTA. We have a temperature scanner on board. We also have landing equipment, but if we're going to land and still be propulsively powerful, we, ha we have to land like a pencil again. And at this point, the humanitarian aspect of our space program, small as it may be, does rear its head. Because let's see what has happened to Valentina so far. She was sent out as a pioneer to land on IOTA, which she did splendidly. Then, unfortunately, her craft fell over. This happened in previous episodes, by the way. Check them out if you haven't. Uh, her craft fell over, and she was stranded on the surface in just a command pod. Then, about a month later, a rescue ship arrived. She, it didn't land, though. She had to, like, jet back up into orbit to meet it herself. This was a very bare-bones, cheap rescue. Then, the rescue ship lost fuel. Well, it didn't lose fuel. It just ran out of it. Bad mission planning on my behalf. This is where she was stranded now, in the Tri-Capsule. It's been, with this long extended rendezvous, about another month. Here's a rescue ship. She's on board. Home is in sight. There's enough fuel to get home. There's a heat shield to protect them getting down. Are we going to send them out again to land in a wobbly ship? I can't do it. I just can't do it. Also, there's three astronauts on board, and if they are marooned, there's no one left to go get them. You have one, like, passenger class astronaut. So these guys have to return home. So the decision has been made. We're here at our uh, Gale Periapsis, and we are going to use the fuel in this rocket to slow the hell down. We're going to make this the gentlest landing in history, because our brave astronauts, they sure have deserved it. By the way, talking about mission plans, I wanted to do maybe a flyby of SETI, which Delta V-wise would have been well within the budget, but no maneuver node planning. And that makes it really hard to go from like an elongated orbit like the one we had, to a sort of efficient or even possible intercept with another planet and then get back up. So we opted not to do that. Besides, we still have the barrel of boom in the hangar. We can use that to perform our IOTA flag planting mission at the least and possibly do some of the temperature scans also because that has a squat and stable lander rather than a long and ungainly spindly one. Anyway, back to the landing that can of course still go really wrong where we would still lose these three astronauts. Now this is a very unenvironmental thing to do. We are in orbit and we are about to descend into the atmosphere with plenty of fuel. But we still separate the side boosters for that little bit of efficiency that's not needed at all. But at least there's like a memorial in orbit now, right? We've got these two fuel tanks that, you know, we could have brought them down or at least safely deorbited them, but we didn't because we're idiots. Anyway, we're targeting the biggest land mass to land on because our lander has parachutes <coughs> and also landing legs. So it'd be a shame not to use them. Anyway, here we go, time warping, hoping to land in the sunlight, but yeah, it's sort of happening. We're going to land like in the dusk or the dawn. It's always hard to tell which one it will be looking down from space. I, I don't know which way this planet is rotating. Competent mission planners would have possibly accounted for this, but we're targeting continents, so it's hard. it doesn't really matter. Anyway, we're burning the engine to slow us down as much as we can. We have plenty of fuel. Uh, the qu only question is, will it be able to decelerate it to safe speeds uh, so that the nozzle can survive atmospheric entry before it doesn't? Yeah, that sentence got away from me. Anyway, we are burning fuel as the air is burning us. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, if it goes wrong and the cigar explodes, we should be fine because we still have a heat shield and could then uh, resume the entry ballistically. Unless, of course, the explosion happens to knock us sideways, and then the aerodynamic stresses could, like, destroy the vehicle. So, in a way, this is way more risky than just um, attempting to enter on the heat shield. But, you know, we wanted to give them a luxurious re-entry, and this is it. It's luxurious in the way that we're using fuel that would not otherwise be available for a re-entry. So that makes it luxurious by 
virtue of scarcity and irregularity. Not necessarily by virtue of safety or smartness. But, you know, it's something you hardly do, so here we go. Everything seems to be going fine. We're at 15 kilometers now into the thicker parts of the atmosphere. The engine is still performing, hasn't exploded, there's still fuel for it. And now I'm considering to like put uh, deploy the parachutes first, I shuffled the stages already. And the plan was to then land propulsively, but that's again landing on this really long spindle. And it would be a damn shame to have it topple in the mountains of Gale, which is basically home, and then kill the astronauts. So, uh, we're not going to land completely propulsively. We're going to deploy the parachutes and then drop the rocket bit. And we can see conveniently where it explodes. Use that as an altitude gauge. Information with which we'll do nothing. Because there's nothing left to do on this craft. We have landing legs, we have parachutes deployed. And basically our faith is in the hands of physics. Which, depending on how you did the math, is either very comforting or very, very scary. Um, the rocket exploded, as per the plan. We're gonna do some science, of course, because we can. And, well, af after we do that, there's nothing left for it to go back down. And while we do that, uh, let me talk to you about the next episode, where we will do this mission with the barrel O boom. I will still upload the persistent.sfs behind the usual link. Um, you can still, of course, make craft, but make your craft for SETI. Because I hope to complete the, the IOTA mission, or at least one of them, with the Barrel of Boom craft. And that will happen shortly. Um, there's no need to put more. Um, anyway, that episode will come shortly after this one. I think I'm going to do it tonight, even. Uh, right, what happened? I didn't th throttle back the time warp. Which was a shame because maybe the legs would have survived if I had. But fortunately the craft survived and that's of course the important bit. I want to do an EVA flag science thing but we can't because the hatch is obstructed. Which is a shame. But then again we are home so let's uh, let's recover that vessel and, and be done with it really. There's a few more minutes of footage left and even though I'm from the future I can't really remember what we did with that. So let's let's see, and I'll I'll be as much a spectator as you. So we're looking at the at the VAB. There's the barrel of boom. Maybe maybe I was I think past me was was giving the speech about the next episode in in this bit as as I was previously. So yeah, let's just let's just end it there, and uh, see you for the next episode where we'll be using this this barrel of boom, and of course make your craft. Target them for SETI, exploration, and possibly landing. Although we don't know anything about this moon, how large it is, what the gravity is like. So maybe maybe a set of probes to like chart its its gravity environment and, and see if there's an atmosphere, see see what the G is like, and those kind of things. Make me some science probes with landers, however fancy you like.